Hello, everybody. We have another guest composer with us today. I will ask him to introduce himself shortly. But before we do that, I would like to thank anybody who is going to watch us live. Thank you very much for your interest and your support. I would also like to thank anybody who will watch this interview later as a recorded interview for your interest as well and your support. So we can see one person, two people are already watching us live. It's gone up to two. So let's get straight into the interview. So our guest composer today, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Lovely to be here. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Kindly introduce yourself. Okay, um, so Wede, th thank you very much for having me. Thank you for this um, really fantastic project. Um, I think it's been a long time coming uh, that somebody has started to kind of put together um, resources in the way that you're doing um, about African composers. It's very exciting and it's really wonderful to see. Um, there are so many interesting African composers. It's great that there is now a, a central resource, as it were, um, just uh, which also is wonderfully open-minded in this approach, which I think is very important. Um, so myself, uh, so I'm Robert Rockins, as you can see. Um, I'm a South African composer. I was born in uh, Port Elizabeth in the Eastern Cape in South Africa. Uh, moved to Cape Town quite young and basically grew up in Cape Town. Um, I was extremely fortunate uh, in my upbringing to have gone to a really great school, I went to Rundabosch Boys School in Cape Town, which had fantastic music departments the whole way through to the primary school and the high school. Um, met wonderful people like Better Wise, who was very important to me. Um, she was a choral trainer and she taught me piano, but she also trained the choirs that I was involved with. Um, so that that was i was extremely fortunate to have that and then of course uh at the time around about the early 80s when i was growing up um the the music school Beausole was formed in in, in cape town uh, where i was very lucky to have violin lessons and, and string orchestra training from a whole lot of wonderful people um i was extremely fortunate to have all of that um and also piano lessons and so basically i grew up playing the violin playing the piano um and doing a lot of singing and singing has always been really important um, I then, uh, for, uh, I, I nearly didn't study music actually, I, I took a moment after school, I thought to myself, well, uh, is this really what I want to do? I knew I didn't want to be a violinist, um, I wasn't really sure about uh, singing and um, you know, whether one, whether singing was a viable career at the time and whether the type of voice I had was going to work. So I, I sort of thought to myself, well, maybe I'll go and study something else instead and I, I almost went to study journalism. Um, but I realized if, if a month or so before I was supposed to go, I realized that actually being a journalist was quite a, quite a complex profession, shall we say, and I didn't necessarily play to my strengths. So I, I decided not to do that. And I took a year off um, and worked as a waiter for a while and did various other things. And I was very fortunate during that time um, to do two things. The first was that some friends from school who um, We'd done some uh, cabarets sort of work in school where we, we every year the school would put in a cabaret and students would arrange lots of music and they'd perform it and everything. Uh, doing the music of Queen, hilariously. Um, and we decided uh, that we were going to, myself and two other friends, uh, very close friends, decided that we were going to go and put on a show of the music of Queen um, at the Grahamstown National Arts Festival. And also trying to tour it around, and uh, so that was one that became a really important part of that year, sort of arranging the musical queen, transcribing it, arranging it, um, and rehearsing and performing it. And at the same time, roughly the same time, uh, Betty Wise got back in touch because um, she was now she left Von Bosch uh, School and she moved on to uh, become the uh, chorus mistress at uh, what used to be called KPAB, the K Performing Arts Board. Um, and which is now kept on opera essentially. And she invited me to sing with the opera company as a baritone, which was as a sort of an extra chorus member. So I spent, uh, um, I did about five productions with them in the end, um, which was really what sold me uh, on becoming a composer because uh, I would sit in rehearsals, uh, particularly Turandot, I, I was involved in a chorus of uh, Turandot, which is Turandot. And, um, it was just the most extraordinary experience, and it was the thing that really made me go, actually, no, this is really what I want to be doing with my time. Um, so I ended up then uh, enrolling at the University of Cape Town. Um, and I was also very fortunate during the year that I was with uh, Cape Town Opera um, that Veta also asked me to help with what was then the very first choral training program. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, extraordinarily, this is 1994 we're talking about. Um, and it was the first time that uh, any um, black singers had been brought into 
uh, Cape Town Opera to uh, to sing. Actually, I mean, there'd, there'd been a few uh, coloured mixed race kind of uh, singers who'd come along. And obviously, there was a massive singing tradition that was completely, fully in existence, independently of anything else, um, as we know. Uh, but in 1994, for the first time, Cape Town Opera thought, okay, well, we'd better get some black singers in. Um, and that was really kind of the beginning, I think, of many of the laws and things that are happening now um, with uh, young South African singers. So that, that was very exciting. Um, I had a very minor role in that. I used to just sort of assist by playing the piano, um, the guy called Lungile Jacobs, who is a very experienced choral conductor and, um, and musician. Um, I just sort of helped by kind of plunking a few notes to the piano and occasionally offering a, a word or two of, of, of thoughts. But, uh, you know, he, he was far more experienced than me and, and didn't really need my help, frankly. But it was, it was enormously valuable for me to be there. Um, I learned a lot from him and, and from the chorus uh, there. Um, and then I went and studied at UCT. I was very, very fortunate to go to UCT, uh, University of Cape Town, which I think is clearly one of the one of the top institutions, certainly in South Africa. Um, and I think what I loved about UCT, I mean, I went as a violinist and I mean, I went to study composition, um, but the way the course is structured there, um, you couldn't actually really study composition properly until about second or third year. Um, mm -hmm. So, but what was extraordinary about UCT was, um, uh, was the range of music that was being studied there. So there's a fantastic classical course, obviously, um, but there's also uh, an opera school. So it's not independent, but it's sort of a, it exists in its own right. It's a very, very powerful opera school that has generated lots of these extraordinary singers that we're seeing, that we're seeing coming out uh, from South Africa now. It also has a fantastic jazz department, um, and I was very lucky to study jazz arrangement and jazz harmony and that sort of thing as well alongside my course. And then there was also a really fantastic African music department that was led at the time by Deirdre Hansen, Deirdre Hansen, who was an expert in Tulsa music. And she also, we also worked a lot with Yves Kwaikis, the Amon um, Pondo, and you know, really, really uh, incredibly experienced uh, performer and sort of advocate for, for African music. Uh, obviously focused very much in Southern Africa, but also he was you know, with Papa Akabinda and Vera and you know, everything from around the, from around the continent. Um, so it was an incredibly rich experience. So I'd be playing the violin in, in my orchestra and rehearsing and practicing. I'd be doing um, my jazz arrangement. Uh, I didn't really perform jazz very much. I'd be singing in an early music ensemble that I put up together with some friends. I'd be playing in the, you know, in the African music ensemble. Um, I, I mean, my, my one great regret from my time at UCT is that I didn't spend more time with the with the African music ensemble. Um, I did it for about a year or year and a half or so, um, but then you know pressures got a bit too much because uh, by then I was composing as well. So it was a very very rich time, and as I, th I think it was foundationally enormously important for me. Um, to have that breadth of experience and breadth of uh, possibility. So that was great. And um, <clears throat> I then started composing more. I was very fortunate. Like I said, the, the way the course was structured at the time, composition sort of only really started kicking off uh, in the second or third year. So I found um, the father of a very good friend of mine, uh, who is uh, so uh, Peter Louis van Dijk, um, who is a well-known South African composer, particularly of choral music, actually, but I mean, he's just, he is just a fantastic composer and also an exceptional teacher. And so I studied with him for a few years. Um, his son, Zandi van Dijk, is, uh, is one of my best friends, like I say, he's a viola player who plays uh, now in Germany in the Munich Chamber Orchestra and also has his own quartet. Um, but so P Peter and his family, and uh, they've also, uh, uh, Peter's other son, Matthijs, is a fantastic South African composer that you might have come across as well. Um, so, you know, uh, that was really a very valuable relationship relationship on all sorts of levels. Peter encouraged me to get my music performed by, um, you know, Zandi Play has, is still one of the one of the people who's played most of my music. Um, and so that was very rich. And uh, while when I came to towards the end of the end of my studies there, I um, wanted it, like I said, always decided composition was the way to go. And I then applied to various institutions, um, most in the UK, uh, and came over, did my auditions and ended up at the Royal Academy of Music. Uh, which was uh, which I did a two year master's there in composition. But there again, you know, I'd, I'd been extremely busy at UCT with all the various things I was doing. I was also running the, I was the orchestra manager at UCT. Um, I also worked with the Simon Estes Choral Group, which uh, which was run by the recently and very sadly deceased Nolifef and Chabe. Um, she had a choir which competed in the National Old Mutual uh, Festival. And I actually went with them to the festival one year and performed in the finals of the Old Mutual Choir Competition, which was uh, one of the most 
remarkable experiences I think of my life. It was it was it really was enormously uh, powerful. Um, so you know there was that, and you know there was just so much going on. And then I went to, to the academy, and like most masters courses, it's the world over. You know you've got a couple of classes a week, and then you're just sort of left to your own devices to do your work basically. And I found that quite terrifying to be honest. So I ended up doing lots of stuff there as well. Um, so I took a whole lot of courses that I didn't need to take just because I was interested. Sort of courses in contemporary music, courses in uh, I did a, a course in sort of beginner jazz piano, which I wasn't very good at, but I really enjoyed and found a lot of interest in. And I did a choral conducting course, which is extremely important to me, um, uh, run by a man called Patrick Russell, who is the head of music at the, uh, I've got to get this right, uh, at the Brompton Oratory, which is the Catholic, one of the Catholic cathedrals, uh, cathedrals in London. He's a remarkable man and a very, very, uh, very understated, very, uh, but enormously generous and enormously um, gifted musician and wonderful teacher. So the reason I mention him is because conducting has gradually become more important to me. I do a lot of choral conducting um, at, you know, at my university job and um, various other places. Um, and I, he, I think, is sort of, as a conducting teacher, he was one of the most important people um, that I've uh, that I've worked with. So I did two years at the academy, um, which was really valuable, meeting lots and lots of musicians, getting to know lots of people. Uh, met one of my other big collaborators um, who's played a lot of my pieces, uh, for whom I've written a lot of pieces, Harriet McKenzie, who's a wonderful violinist. Um, I met her at the academy and we got to know each other and, like I say, started that relationship. And various other relationships, various uh, fascinating people there. Obviously, um, one of the great things about the London Conservatoire is that they do draw people from all over the world um, who are extraordinary. Um, and it's just such a privilege to be in a, in a space like that where you can kind of just you can say to somebody oh would you play this for me and think oh this is really hard they're going to struggle and of course they just sort of knock it out for you in a few days and you think well okay maybe i can write something a bit harder next time um but anyway that's a, that's all by the by so that so that was very valuable and then I, whilst i was at the academy i met michael finnessy who is um uh, who was at that stage teaching at the academy um he then left the academy but he'd already been teaching at the university of southampton and um he I started having lessons with him after a viva I had in my first year where he asked some really extraordinarily penetrating questions that really got to the heart of what I was trying to do and what the problems were that I was facing. And I just thought to myself, well, this seems fairly obvious. And I went and studied with him in Southampton to do my PhD. And I was very fortunate. I think I think if I've learned anything from anybody, um, most of it was from him, really. I mean, he's a really extraordinary supervisor. Um, a, a remarkable composer, remarkable musician, remarkable mind, just in every way. So I, I owe a lot to him, I think. So, so yes, that was my kind of studies. Um, by that stage, very much, uh, I was already having a few performances around uh, around the UK and in South Africa mostly. Um, and then I took a couple of years. I was teaching violin. Um, I taught the violin a lot, uh, particularly to sort of secondary school students for a number of years. I started teaching at Junior Trinity. Uh, so Trinity College of Music, like all of the big conservatories in the UK, runs a Saturday morning, a Saturday school. I say Saturday morning, it used to be a nine hour day off and it was pretty full on for everybody. Yes, yeah, so, so we would start. I mean, the students had it harder than us, actually, because they were so busy. But, you know, you would sometimes have lessons at 8.15 in the morning and you'd finish at 6.15 in the evening and you would have had a 10 minute break somewhere along the way. Um, and you were tired, but you, you were ne it, it never felt exhausting. It was it was just so stimulating and so exciting because you'd have these really enthusiastic and fascinating young uh, young musicians um with so much energy themselves and it was just it was wonderful so so that was very exciting and a wonderful um uh the the head of that service uh, marianne friend uh, was an extraordinary person to work for you know another person who really i learned a lot from you know, she was able to uh, she was one of those people who was able to kind of see where the problems were going to be with within a cohort of a few hundred students you would know exactly what all of the issues were she'd know what issues you might be having and she'd always just gently put things out and mm -hmm. Sort of say, oh, have you thought about this? Maybe this student needs a wage. And it really learned a lot from her as a leader, I think. So that was enormously valuable. Um, I've been very lucky, I think. I've met some amazing people and I've had some wonderful experiences. I've, you know, I do consider myself extremely fortunate. So um, whilst I was doing that, I then um, was invited to go and teach uh, at Cardiff University for doing some part time teaching, uh, teaching third year undergraduate students. Um, and on the back of that, uh, then uh, they then opened up a full-time post, uh, which I sort of slightly flippantly applied for, uh, because you know, it's the the job market for composers, as I'm sure we all know, is uh, is not exactly um, uh, it's not a thriving one, shall we say? You know, the, the the jobs are, as I like to say, like like empty. They they come up very often, very seldom, and when they come, you know, 
everyone applies for them. So I applied sort of thinking, well, you know, I might as well because I'm here. And I was very fortunate to get an interview and they gave me the job. So I've been here since 2011, really. Um, and I moved to Cardiff in 2003, for a year and a half. Uh, and then we moved to Cardiff in 2012. Well, 2000, yes, my future was in 12, 2013 or so. Um, and had children and got married and, you know, did all of those sorts of things all at the same time. So it was a couple of very intense years, shall we say. And for a, for the first year and a half of my job in Cardiff, I was still teaching at Junior Trinity on Saturday. So it was a pretty, pretty wild time, shall we say, with a, with a baby who was born in the middle of that and another one on the way. So it was, it was pretty, pretty exciting, shall we say. So, yes, and then I've been in Cardiff since then. Um, at the university, I teach composition from first year undergraduate, although I've not taught them for a couple of years, but I, I have taught a lot of the first year courses, um, second year, third year, uh, master's students, PhD. Um, I've also taught conducting a little bit. Um, I you know, do bits of analysis and that sort of thing. And the one big thing that I've been doing since I started was running the contemporary music group. Um, which has been uh, a real joy, actually, uh, because I'm free to program anything I like, um, which has been very exciting. And one of the things I've really enjoyed uh, is exploring uh, a number of African composers. So I've done about three projects now where, where I've presented music by. Um, uh, the first project I did was uh, more broadly African composers, so people like Justin and Tomasuza, uh, Akinuba, um, some pieces by quite inevitably quite a few pieces by South African composers because that's you know those really the contacts that I've had. But um, we did a broad range of things, Andile Kumalo, uh, and then more recently I focused on South African music. So last December I did a concert of. Um, Music by South African composers. Uh, I can't remember about fourteen different composers. It was a bit of a bit of an epic concert, as often happens with these things. You think, oh, I'll invite all these composers, and some of them will reply, some of them won't. Some of the pieces won't work, but they all replied, and they all sent me pieces I could do. And I thought, well, I can't not do these pieces. They, you know, there's great music here, and so so that's been a real joy. I've also recorded with the ensemble, with the vocal ensemble, because. As a contemporary mu music group, you know, you sort of assume it's sort of three, three double basses and a kazoo, but it's actually, um, I have a, a regular fixture of the ensemble as a vocal group. And uh, so we basically have a vocal ensemble and we have an instrumental ensemble. The instrumental ensemble is very flexible. The vocal ensemble is kind of fairly standard, about 20 voices or so. Um, we, to about three years ago, I recorded a CD of Welsh contemporary choral music all by living composers. Um, on the TCAS label, and TCAS is an organization in Wales that supports contemporary music in Wales and music making in Wales generally. So, yeah, that's a very long introduction, and I do apologize uh, for that. I hope it was at least interesting in some way. <clears throat> it absolutely was. It was not a long introduction. If you mean it in a negative sense, it was brilliant. And it, it also is contributory to was one of the goals of this, this uh, program, recording African history correctly, you know, and accurately, hearing from the history creators directly. So thank you, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, you have quite a, a long history with music. You've taken us right back to the very beginning of when you started, an alternative route that you could have taken, which was into journalism. It's been brilliant hearing that journey because I was going to ask if music always was the goal for you. Um, you did mention being, sorry, did you want to say something about that? Uh, well, I, I guess um, it's a really interesting question. I've always loved music and I think singing particularly has always been one of the great joys of my life. I, you know, I didn't compose very much at school. Um, I did a little bit of composing, um, but as seems to be the nature of my life, I've spent a lot of time doing lots of other things. Like I did lots of sport at school, um, you know, theater, you know, there, I was, I seem to always be quite busy, um, which perhaps is something I need to think about. So, so there were lots of options presented to myself. And like I said, at the end of school, um, uh, I think particularly because of practicing the violin too much. And I have a slightly, I mean, I love the violin and I've written a lot of string music, but I do have a slightly complicated relationship with the violin, shall we say. And I think yeah. practicing it a bit too hard for my final recital uh, at at school kind of made me think, oh, maybe this is not really what I want to be doing. And I hadn't quite seen that composing was the way forward at that stage for myself. So so the answer is no, actually. It was, it was, a, very de it was a very specific and determined choice that I made when I had time to reflect on it. Okay. You, you, you I'm echoing for reason. Okay. I think I'm echoing from that end. Do you have a headset? Do you have a headset? Yes, to put it, yeah, let me put a headset on. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. Ah, the echo is gone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Fantastic. You talked about being fortunate um, a few minutes ago. Um, 
if we, if we talk about fortune, fortune can be financial, it can mm -hmm. be moral support. When you decided to go into music, when you decided to take this path, were there any detractors at the early stage? Was there anything from friends, family, or did you just happen to be among a group of people who were going along the same lines so it was easy or easier? Uh, I've never had anybody, when I was making that decision, nobody ever said to me, you can't do this. I was extremely fortunate. My parents uh, were very supportive. Um, uh, I mean, they weren't in a position to be massively financially supportive. Uh, supportive. My parents were divorced, it's a long, long ago story, but um, I was, they never once said to me, this is crazy, what do you think you're doing? They always said, you know, we want you to enjoy what you do. Um, you seem to have a talent of some description from your experiences at school. Um, you know, they were very supportive when I talked about doing journalism. And when I said, I don't want to do this, they said, that's also fine. Um, what do you want to do? Have a think about it, take some time. And I did, and I thought very hard about it. And like I say, they, they never once questioned it. Um, I obviously was surrounded at school by lots of musicians. I played in the National Youth Orchestra in South Africa for a number of years. Um, and at Beausoleil, at the music school, there was a, a wonderful kind of you know, group of young people learning the instruments that I could play with in string orchestras and, and sort of symphony orchestras and that sort of thing. So in that context, it never felt like a strange choice. I think I was always very conscious that it was, you know, we all know that music, music uh, of the type that we're making, uh, whether sort of classical music more generally or contemporary music specifically, it's it's not a money spinner. Um, that's never been a concern for me. I've always felt that as long as I can make a living and be relatively secure, I, I'm I'm not really that fussed about money. So um, as long as I'm as long as I feel, feel I can feed myself and my family and put a roof over my head, then I'm totally happy. So I made it sort of in that knowledge, um, and nobody ever said to me. Me, this is ridiculous why would you do that um you know I, I suspect there were some people who thought oh well is that is that a wise choice but nobody nobody ever said it to me so that's great um so yes i've been very fortunate in that way no, nobody's ever kind of said oh you shouldn't do this this is a bad idea okay and when we talk about uh fortune from another direction mm. being fortunate uh to have received what you describe as uh, support throughout your studies so mm. from different organizations would if you had not had this support would you have had to change your path or would yes, you have to yes. slowly? Oh, okay. Ab absolutely. Yes. I mean, I, uh, like I said, I mean, my, my, I was, I wasn't poor or anything like that, but it was, my parents certainly couldn't have helped me. I mean, I did, they couldn't have helped me study overseas, for example. Um, even, even studying a GCT would have been a challenge without things like the Samro bursaries. You know, Samro has been a great supporter of me over the years. And I was very fortunate to win uh, the uh, overseas scholarship. Um, I was, I, I was watching your interview with Conrad the other day. So so Conrad and I share the fact that we both uh, uh, got the overseas scholarship from Samro um, and also that we both ended up studying at the Royal Academy of Music, which is very nice. Um, but uh, without that and about, I mean, I'll be really honest, I think to, to study at uh, the Royal Academy of Music just to pay my fees, I think I've got about six different bursaries from different sources. Um, you know, it's it, being, you know, coming from South Africa with the currency, even back then, um, the currency just had no weight uh, against the pound. Um, it's hard. It's much harder now, I think. Um, but yes, yeah, so I had I had to do quite a lot of applications. I'll say that much. Um, but you know, th th that's just what it. That's just what the business looks like for us. You know. Um, but certainly, without without those bursaries, I, I would never have been able to afford to study at the academy. And like I say, even UCT would have been a challenge um, without some support. Uh, and then my PhD. Um, I got a bit. My father died, and I got a bit of money from that. And that because I and the only reason I mentioned that is because I, I wasn't planning to do the PhD initially, um, and so didn't apply in an, an advance for bursaries and things like that. So when I decided to do it, I didn't have any money apart from this money that my father had left me. So I used that to pay my first year fees, and then um, got a really nice scholarship from Southampton for the rest of my PhD, which I was you know which was I was very fortunate to get that as well. But yes, I mean none of this would have happened without that financial support. Um, that you know none of it would be would have been even remotely conceivable to be honest. So so yes, I, that again very very fortunate that, that I had some decisions in my favour which really have made things possible. Okay, I'm um, sorry to hear about the, the death, the passing of your father. Um, but yes, it's it's interesting to hear about the kinds of uh, support that you've received over the years and how these have been instrumental in helping you, you know, progress yeah. along your chosen path. Yeah. Uh, there is something you mentioned earlier about a change that came about by one of your, your colleagues who decided to expand the, 
the variety of people who were included in, I think, in an orchestra. Um, oh, it, in it, Cape Town Opera, you mean? I, mean? I believe. Yes, uh, when, when the, the, yes. So, uh, so that was the. I, I think you mean the the choral training program at Cape Town Opera, where where I was working with um, with Lungila Jacobs and the and the first cohort of of black singers that were brought into yeah, yeah. Uh, into Cape Hope. Yes, I mean that. You know, to to understand. I mean, you know, I I always try to understand my my life in the context of people who you know, and there are so many who are even significantly less fortunate than me um and it's uh you know it's it's quite it's quite humbling and i and i know people use that word a lot but it is actually very humbling to see how people strive and achieve uh, against some of the odds that they are put against i mean I, i'm you know there are a number of people that i just think how did you actually do that? I mean, even even on the simple level of you know things like you know, uh, we get we have a lot of Chinese students in Cardiff at the moment in the UK, um, and I'm always and I've seen this you know at the academy as well. We had quite a few students who uh, again who are working a different language, for example, and you so, you sort of think to yourself, well, it's quite hard doing this course. This is a tough course. This person is doing their course in their second or third language. Um, and is working, you know, if I'm working 12 hours a day just to get through this course, they must be working 18 hours a day. You know, so, uh, and, and similarly with, uh, you know, in South Africa, there, there are so many people who are coming from nothing and, and really have um, their talent and their commitment and their drive. And it's, and I mean, I'm sorry, that is actually humbling to, to sort of recognize uh, the extraordinary achievements. I'm, I'm working at the moment with a, a wonderful South African baritone called uh, Jabula Madlala. Um, you know, and his story is is exactly that. You know, he um, he grew up in in KwaZulu Natal, um, really not well off at all. Uh, he got into through the quality through the quality of his voice and his talent. He got into an opera company that was working in the UK between the UK and South Africa, basically. Um, and when he was in the UK, somebody just came up to him and said, you know, they heard him in a performance and they came up to him after a performance and said, um, you should go and audition at the Guildhall. And he just went to the guild hall he just turned up and said i'd like to audition this person told me to come and audition here and um they said uh that's a bit unusual but okay if this person said so you can come and sing for us and you know his he's built his whole career simply by grafting and working and 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 also having this uh extraordinary voice that he's developed um and it's you know it's the sort of story that you think well again you know he was there's always a bit of fortune in there for all of us, but there is also just the sheer hard work and determination that you want to do something. And um, like I say, for people coming from a place that's uh, that's um, so much harder than where I come from, I can't, I can't even conceive how tough that must be and how tough-minded people have needed to be and determined. So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question at all. I can't even remember what the question was, but uh, <laughs> Let's begin to address it. I, I'm I'm kind of wondering what what has been lost to South Africa and to the world mm. uh, because of the fact that it, it had to take somebody at a point in history to open up the opportunities to others. Hard work matters, but there are situations where no matter yeah. how hard work, if it has been shut. Yeah. Uh, would it, uh, this, I, I think this is genuinely one of the great tragedies of South Africa. I mean, it, it really, you, you just sort of think to yourself, when you see how successful young South African singers are being at the moment in the world, just for example, let's take singing because we're talking about music. If you look at just how successful those guys are, people like Priti Yende, people like Jabulo, uh, Pumeza Machikiza, you know, um, Golda Schultz, all of these guys who, you know, 30 years ago wouldn't have been allowed to study opera. Um, you just think to yourself, but this is bonkers. You know, how, how could how could a country sort of say to itself, well, you know, these these people are allowed to do this and those people are allowed to do that. And and we really have lost so much. I mean, and so, there are so many, I think, genuinely tragic stories of, of extraordinary musicians who achieve great things. But because of the nature of the um, of the apartheid system, had to achieve those within the confines of their own community and had no way of getting out of that community. Um, you know, and I think that's uh, yeah. I mean, that there is no other word for it than tragic. I think it's it, it's just so utterly wasteful. Um, and uh, and again, you sort of given how how extraordinary things are now and how the talent is just being mm. being supported in the most difficult circumstances. Again, you know, I you know I teach at Cardiff University. You know, we sometimes grumble about funding and things like that. It's never an easy situation. But you know, it's really tough to be a musician in Africa and, and in South Africa. You know, it's, the support is difficult in terms of institutional support. It's very very hard. Um, 
so to see the level of achievement coming out of that despite that is really quite it's quite impressive actually i think it speaks both to the to the talent that's there but also to the hard work and the determination and, and all of those sorts of things i mean and and also the teachers who are who are helping people find and achieve those goals it's it's really quite uh, quite a remarkable achievement i think with your contribution as well you know promoting being a south african composer so just by being and then promoting <laughs> positivity and what can come out of south africa hopefully you know there will be more support for uh, more and more south african composers and musicians um one can only hope so i mean you know it's it's money is always hard as we know um i mean the thing is as far as i'm concerned you know uh, i i like to promote south, south african and african composers when i can um you know i sort of uh, introduce all of these composers to my students um and i try and support uh, initiatives where a south african composer being supported but i can't I, you know I, I do what i can um i'd love to do more that you know we all would um but like you say i think simply just being um and doing the best you can with what you have i, th I think is is really important because that's actually how things happen you know pe yeah. everybody everybody does everybody stay uh, keeps acting positively um towards uh, towards their own agenda and i think it's really important to say that this needs to be driven by your own personal kind of this is what i want to do and if you're doing that and you're doing it positively and you're not breaking other people down um and you're supporting people where you can i think you're doing what you can um, you're doing what you can to help help move things forward yes yes so speaking of your own agenda and you know <laughs> deciding your own path and your own style, <laughs> yes. the music as some of your music has been described as hilarious sad strange <laughs> How will you describe your composition style? And when, after you've done that, we'll listen to one of your compositions. Okay, um, I think it's it's it is always a difficult question for composers, um, particularly uh, if you haven't. You know, uh, it's difficult. Often people are encouraged not to think about their style. I mean, I always I always try to encourage students to think about what it is that they are making. Um, you know, you know. Often when I start with my PhD students, which is I think really where people at the sort of age and the level where students have enough information and enough skill and enough technique um, for you to then start saying to them, okay, now you need to start choosing. Um, what is it of these things that I've introduced to you that we've introduced to you that you've learnt about in your music making? What is it about these things? What of these things are going to be important to you? And so, um, I was again, as I said before, I was very fortunate uh, studying with Michael Finnessy because uh, that was really his uh, very big thing. Is he would say to me, "Well, you could write that, um, but that does sound like about fifty other young composers who've come to me this week and that I've heard in concert halls." Um, is is that actually the is that really what you want to say? You know, is that actually what you have to say for yourself? Um, would you you know do you want to do you want to stand uh, hovering over your grave watching people go? Yes, that was his greatest achievement. He never said that to me, but that but that's kind of really that, that's the level on which he worked. It was can you stand by this? Can you can you really say this is what you meant? Um, and he just kept that pressure on the whole way through. And I think fundamentally, um, it really revealed a lot of things to me. Um, and one thing was that um, I'd, when I'd come to the UK, I was relatively inexperienced as a composer. Um, I'd been composing properly, like I said before, since my first year at university. I'd done little bits and pieces before that. Um, but not much at all. So I was quite inexperienced. I was very lucky to get into the academy. I was very lucky to get this bursary that supported me to get there. Um, and so I then sort of threw myself into contemporary music in, in London and sort of found out, you know, just learned about as much as I could, listened to as much as I could, went to as many concerts as I could. Um, and I just found, you know, uh, there was a lot of music that didn't particularly excite me. Um, and often people would be saying, oh, this music's amazing. You must know this composer. You must go and study this. It's really important. And I'd go and listen to it and think, well, OK, you could do that. Um, and then maybe sometimes I think, oh, well, I'd better, I'd better try and do that too um, and see see if that works for me. And, you know, I think really as a young composer, what you're doing is you're trying on lots of garments, aren't you? You're going, mm, does this hat fit me? Hmm, no. Uh, these jeans, no, they're a bit too big for me. Or, you know, do you know what I mean? There's there's that kind of element of learning. You're sort of trying on these different things and seeing what they seeing what they do. And really, uh, having done that, Michael then was saying to me, no, hold on a minute. Is this really what you mean? And I think I found, uh, sorry, this is all a very long preamble to, to answering your question. I'm, I'm getting there. Um, so so what, I, what I found was, uh, you know, I, I would sort of write a piece. In fact, I remember very vividly, I wrote a piece. It was a setting um, of a, 
uh, it's Emily Dickinson poem, I think, which a friend had asked me to write. And I'd sort of started off with a string, uh, writing for string quartet and voice. And I'd written this incredibly dense, busy, you know, there were lots of demi semi quavers on the page. And I was looking at this thing, oh, this is very exciting. And I took it to Michael and he said, is that really what you want in this piece? Is that really what this piece is about? Is that, you know, is that, is that really, you know, the, the texture that's supposed to be happening? And I went to ask, what about this for ages? I thought, no, actually it's not. And I stripped it away completely. And the piece ended up with mostly in kind of slow quavers and crotchets pretty much the whole way through in uh, both the voice part and the accompaniment. And that was really kind of an important moment of, of just trying to get on the page exactly what it was I was trying to do. And, um, one of the big challenges all young composers face, and certainly one that I was struggling with, was pitch content um, in what your notes are, what your pitch is, what your harmony is going to be, and where it comes from. And um, at this point of sort of really trying to dig down into who I was and what I was trying to do and everything, um, something came back to me that I'd, I'd been, I'd studied a bit in uh, African music in, in Cape Town, um, and I'd had a really kind of uh, extraordinary experience the first time I heard uh, the wonderful bow player, Madusini, I don't know if you come across a really extraordinary uh, closer bow uh, performer, and we'd we had to go to a lunchtime concert at UCT when it probably wasn't about my first or second year. And um, we all sort of sat down, as you do as a student, thinking, oh, what's going to happen now? And suddenly the lights all went off and the spotlight came on and there was Modacini just sitting. I didn't know who she was. I knew nothing about her or what she did. And um, the spotlight came on and she started playing and it was just extraordinary. Um, and whilst I'd been studying African music, I learned a little bit about um, uh, closer um, uh, bow music, closer pitch traditions, you know, how they use pitch and harmony and that sort of thing and that uh and and i sort of started experimenting with the with the pitch content of that to see what uh what i could do with that and i've uh, and actually that was the beginning of uh, i mean I've, I've i've done nothing else ever since i've always used that that pitch technique that i learned from uh from traditional uh, specifically bow music but also also music more generally sort of it's sort of hexatonic but then based on uh if if you extend the idea um using harmonic partials and that sort of thing you end up with a uh, quite a rich and also sometimes quarter tonal, microtonal sort of world. Um, so it's very simple, um, but it's also, it, it has proven to me sort of perfect for what, it, for what I'm trying to express. It's, it, so that's sort of underlying everything I do. Um, uh, and then on top of that, you know, uh, like I've said, I've, I've been, I've explored all sorts of music in my time. Uh, I've, uh, I've been always been very interested in jazz. I have the sort of slightly strange thing about electronic techno, uh, which I've explored a bit um, in my instrumental music. Uh, some of my orchestral pieces um, sort of comes out in, uh, in the textures and things in some of my chamber pieces. Um, opera is extremely important to me. Um, I've written, uh, I've, not written that much opera. I've written a few little pieces. I did a piece for Cape Town Opera a few years ago um, called The Application um, in their 430 series. But singing is very important to me. And, and actually the one thing that I found really, one of the really interesting tensions I find in my musical life is that I've written a lot for strings um, for various reasons. And I always enjoy it. So, you know, I, I compose using my violin most of the time. I, I compose by pen and paper, pencil and paper and eraser, very important. Um, and uh, and I've got a keyboard for checking various things, but I spend a lot of time actually playing my violin when I'm composing. Um, so string writing comes very naturally to me, but actually vocal writing is really what I'm most interested in. So I've written quite a few songs. I'm, I'm busy writing. I mentioned uh, Jabula Madlala earlier. I'm busy writing an opera for him, a monodrama for him, which we've uh, recently heard we're getting some funding for. And um, we're hoping we were supposed to be presenting that in the autumn, but of course that's still a little bit of a question mark right now. Um, but we're supposed to have a little tour in Wales uh, later this year. Um, uh, also working with a fabulous um, collaborator, librettist called um, Kululi um, Mabija. Um, sorry, I'm just having a brain moment there um who's absolutely fantastic he's uh, he's based in kimberley in south africa and i met him through the 430 um project that i mentioned a moment ago and so he's he and i have been having lots of phone calls and conversations and he, he's just the most wonderful kind of uh, energy that he brings to the project so so vocal music uh, really important to me um and opera i was a big fan i love puccini i love mozart opera um i'm yeah i'm quite sort of traditional that's it i love the monteverdi operas actually they're, they're marvelous um 
Uh, I don't know. There's lots, lots of stuff in there. Uh, like, uh, what else? I mean, I've I've always been very interested also in the minimalist composers, people like Steve Reich and Philip Glass, uh, John Adams, uh, John Cage. Actually, increasingly, his early music. I've never been that interested, um, although you know it is interesting. Um, creatively, uh, his sort of chance pieces are less interesting to me than his really early music from the uh, sort of forties and early fifties. Things like his um, string quartet in four parts and his uh, prepared piano pieces like the Sonatas and Interludes. I think the string quartet actually is probably really important to me um extraordinary beautiful beautiful piece um so yes and then i'm also interested in i just listen as broadly as i can really you know obviously the kind of uh, the european avant-garde um Chirino, um has been very important for me the italian composer um in terms of sound and you, you might not hear it in the music um but in terms of how i the sorts of sounds i try to make in my music Chirino has been quite important um also people like uh um now, Apergis, the Greek French composer who writes a lot for solo voice and like writes sort of really fascinating uh, opera pro projects and that sort of thing. So uh, there's an enormous range of stuff. I just like I just like music to be honest. I mean, you know, as, growing up as a growing up as a as a violinist, you end up playing a lot of Bach, a lot of Mozart, a lot of Beethoven, a lot of Haydn, um, uh, lots of Handel, and I mean, you know, what's better than a Corelli Concerto Grosso? I mean, you know, there's just so much wonderful music out there. So I. I, I just get excited by most most music, to be honest. I mean, I'm played my playing my son's Aha and things like that, just because it's great and it's and it's wonderful music. So I just I just like listening to music and and enjoying it and and taking what I can from it and sort of stealing from it when it really really is good and then go, oh, that's nice. I'm going to take that and and borrow it basically. So I think I think that's yeah, that's I think most composers do that, but that's that's how I describe what I do. Okay, we will play orange um in a few in a few minutes. Um I want to quickly dwell on you know because of some of the things you've said, I think mm. we should explore some of the topics you've raised sure. um, just now. You obviously have an interest in a wide variety of music. I don't think you would shut your door on much no. music or any particular no. style. Or is there something that would make you say, Oh, I don't think so? What about what people call them a tonal? That one is one that gets people <laughs> saying, mm, yeah. you know, I, I think um, uh, I would never shut my door on any type of music. I think I would always have a good listener. You know, ha I've had times in my life where I've been a bit like, oh, I don't like that. That's rubbish um, about various things. Um, I think I'm just I think there is something physical about music that I enjoy um, apart from anything else. Um, but it's also, I mean, so, so, okay, let me answer your question about the eternal composers. No, I think there's, um, I don't always enjoy, I mean, there's so many composers and they're all so different. So to say I don't like eternal music is probably the stupidest thing I could possibly say at this point. Um, there are, I think there are eternal composers to kind of use a very broad uh, and, and potentially uh, unhelpful term, but there are, there are lots of composers who write what we might call atonal music or serial music that I like, and then many that I really don't like. Um, and it really depends on how they, how they do it. That's really what's important for me. So, you know, there are some composers that I, that I listen to think it's not really my thing and there are other composers but that doesn't mean I'd stop listening to it. I mean for example uh, Boulez uh, Le Marteau Sommetre which is a really kind of massive entity in kind of contemporary music I've always found very hard to get into and I've studied it repeatedly to try and sort of work out what it is I've never quite quite got hold of it and I, that may just be me so I mean I'm quite happy to keep going back to it and sort of seeing you know what can I learn from this and I think really as a composer the most important thing is you know when you and I say this to my students all the time, uh, students often you know you'll play them a piece of music and they'll just say oh, I don't like that. I say that doesn't matter, whether you like it or not is entirely irrelevant. You're a composer. You need to listen to it and try and understand it. So if you don't like it, you know why you don't like it. And number one, but also number two, maybe there's something in this that even though you don't like the music as a whole, you can take something from it because I think that's actually really where you start learning. Where you stop worrying about is that nice. And you go, what can I learn from this? Then suddenly you, you know, this is our, it's our business. We work with music. So going, I don't like it is, that's an audience's response um, and an utterly valid one. But as a composer, you've got to think to yourself, I think, I suppose I work on the assumption that all composers mean what they say. And that's not always true. But in terms of, in terms of their, in terms of composers who've, who've succeeded and have become sort of present in the world i think they all did mean what they say because they often made very hard choices in terms of their styles schoenberg for example did what he did because he thought it was essential to do what he did and he believed that was the right thing to do so if you listen to his music and you think to yourself well he obviously didn't mean this this is just he was just trying to be clever then you've missed the point because actually schoenberg really meant what he was doing and he thought it was very important to keep doing it so i think if you approach music on that level 
you start really learning from it and going, okay, why would he have made that choice in that time? And of course, it helps if you understand the context in which Schoenberg was making those decisions. That then sort of becomes, you know, it start, starts becoming a very interesting conversation. And that's where I think you start learning about it. But uh, I mean, a student actually did put up her hand in a, in a lecture a couple of months ago um, in my second year class. And I sort of said, any questions? She put up her hand and said, I'm sorry, I really don't like this very much. I said, I don't mind. That's totally fine, but you do need to learn something from it, you know. And, I, and, it, and for me, that's really the most important composition lesson that I've had, um, and the one that I feel most important to get across to students and, and, and to other people. It, it just doesn't matter, if, especially for composers and musicians. You know, you've got to listen to these things and think, well, what's going on here? Um, and if you don't like it, you can learn how not to do it. Well, if you see me. Brilliant, yes. Um, brilliant. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. Um, I was going to talk about the fact that you are constantly being challenged or you were being challenged by one of your, I think, lecturers or a supervisor who kept saying, is this the message? Is this the style you actually want to put out there? And yes. I see you doing that with your students as well. But this time when it comes to taking things in. But you know, it, it can be difficult as an individual yeah. when you make your mind that this, and this yes. is who I am, this is what I want to say. Then for someone to tell you to reconsider or consider yes. yeah more. but but you see i think that's that's an ongoing yeah as far as i'm concerned if you are serious about being creative that's exactly what you should be doing all the time and so what was valuable for me um with uh with michael saying that to me was precisely that was that he said to me well you know you've come along with these opinions and these things but actually you don't know what you're trying to say with them and so the challenge with this is not to kind of go oh i do this and i do this and that's my little world that i'm in you go to yourself, I'm interested in this, and I'm interested in this, and I'm going to use these techniques, and I'm going to try and make this sort of thing, because that's what I think is important to me. But that's not the same as saying everything else is rubbish. That's a, that's saying this is important to me now, yeah. but I need to keep learning, and I need to keep growing, and I need to be a little bit humble about these things. You know, I think it's uh, it's very difficult. You know, the context of all of this, of course, is, you know, a lot of the, the younger students in the first and second year, they've come in, and they've not really been exposed to contemporary music. A lot, I mean, in the UK, students have done a bit of composing, um, normally, with if they've done an A-level in music or, you know, grade eight uh, associated board or trin Trinity um, exams, they come in and they've done a little bit of composing, but nobody's ever really talked to them about um, things like technique, um, which I think is also absolutely fundamental composition teaching. You have to teach technique and understand that composing is a technical art, like all art, it has a technique. Um, but it's also understanding that those techniques come from, can, can be enormously varied and every different piece has a different technique. So if you understand that that's, you know, that your job as a composer is to keep exploring and keep listening and to keep drawing on whatever you can, um, then it just becomes, as far as I'm concerned, uh, just it's, it's a no brainer, as they say, you know, you have to keep listening and you have to keep learning. And when you hear something you don't like, like I say, it's it. You can, you can choose to just go, well, I don't like that. Um, it's not that interesting to me and I'm not going to study it anymore because actually I've got other things to do. And that, you know, that's actually the big determinant for me of what gets studied and what doesn't is how much time do I have? Um, you know, so at the moment, a student came to me the other day and wanted to, uh, for for one of his modules, wanted to write about Takamitsu. And I know bits of Takamitsu, but I've never really studied his music in any detail. So I was like, oh, yeah, I don't know enough about this to be able to teach something. So I went and got all the all the, all the uh, scores out of the library, and I've been sitting and studying them a little bit and learning from them. And I'm so glad I have, because although I will never write music that sounds like Takamitsu in the sort of broader sense, um, he does some amazing things. And I've learned so many things that I can kind of can borrow from him or steal from him in in kind of just just in that sort of short space of time. I mean, this sort of started in mid-March and I've been listening on and off for the last few. So I think it's just that, that thing of, you know, if you close yourself off, you stop growing. And I think um, a lot of students do come to us um, with the idea that, uh, and, you know, as, you know as you, when you're an 18-year-old, you think you know the world and know what's happened because you've got out of school and all that sort of thing. And it can be very easy to sort of s sit down and go, well, I know what I want to do. Um, so you just need to teach me how to do that better. And as far as I'm concerned, actually, they're coming in and with a different worldview. I say, well, you know a lot of stuff. You're an experienced musician. You've been playing your instrument probably for 10 years at least. You've been having some experience, you know, all that sort of thing. But there's a lot of stuff you don't know. And I'm going to try and help you learn about that. And if you open your mind, just listen learn from things and don't worry too much at this stage whether you like it or not i mean i remember when i started at UC, you know at uct the first time i heard you know weber and i was like ah this is horrible um you know 
but you gradually learn uh, what is valuable about Webern, and Webern certainly isn't at the top of my Spotify list, uh, you know, but he, he is an extraordinary composer as well, and yeah, understanding why he's extraordinary and being able to draw on that when you're composing is, I think, really important. So it's not about so it's not about challenging people with who they are because the, again the other difficulty sorry I'm just uh, if I, if you've had enough just tell me to stop but it, no, I no, mean no. <laughs> the the other thing the other thing that's very important I think for com for composition learning is understanding where you are in a process as well and you know a, a lot of students will start their undergraduate like you say going well this is what I think is nice and this is what I want to do and if you leave them there and don't challenge them and don't push them, then in 10 years time, they're still doing the same thing. And that might be a very good thing, but they've not really kind of grown and they've not made a conscious choice for themselves because they don't actually know what it is that they are that they could be doing differently. And so what I think is really important is that as an educator, you introduce things to people. You say, there's this type of music, there's this type of music, there are these techniques, you could try this, you could try that. And But trying to be clear all the time that what you're not trying to do is say, this is the sort of music you should write. You're saying, this is something that you could could do if you wanted to you should know about it you should know how it's made but later on when you get to start making choices like in your master when you get to the sort of age or the level of a master's degree or a phd level that's when you get to start saying well actually i don't choose to do that i choose to do this differently but it's 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 if you make a choice without knowing what your choices are then you're kind of wasting your time really you know you just end up like that rather than uh, opening yourself out oh Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. You clearly have not allowed yourself to be siloed and you're obviously seeking and trying to learn as much as you can. So that's it's very interesting to hear. Again, I said we'll go to music shortly, one of your compositions. But I do want to talk about this topic that, again, some might frown upon. But there is this question of geniuses and great masters. So we're all supposed to be learning as we go along. Mm -hmm. But exactly where, because somebody, I saw, I saw this post or something online, something along these lines, where somebody said, well, where did the Mozarts of this world learn from? Where did the handles, the Haydn's? Because these are seen as basically the beginning. Mm. Although those who will say, no, no, you have to go all the way back to Gregorian chants. Yeah. The history of music is very interesting because yeah. there are other parts of the world that will say, actually, no, we started the music way before the Gregorian chants. So Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> question about who, who exactly is the epitome. And if a student comes in, thinking they are the epitome. Are you, are you not missing, missing the geniuses of today? Oh, I see you're laughing so <laughs> Yeah, no, you know, I, I I, mean, I think the whole notion of genius is is deeply flawed and it's, it's, uh, you know, I, th I think really composers are people who act in the time that they're in, like all other creative artists. They do what they do um, and some of them do it extremely well and some of them do it uh, quite well and some of them do it quite badly. Um, and really, you know, as as musicians, what we're trying to do, and as people, what we're trying to do is make a life for ourselves. And if you're a composer, you're trying to make yourself a life in which you get to make as much music as you can. Um, and frankly, that's what all the great composers were doing. Um, great composers. Uh, in the same way as, you know, a griot might, uh, that's what they're doing. They're, they're telling stories uh, in the best way that they, they possibly can. They're making music in the best way they possibly can. Um, if you're in a gamelan ensemble or if you play the didgeridoo or, you know, whatever you do as a musician, you are always simply trying to make a bit of money doing what you, what is important to you, I think. So I've, I've never really subscribed to the great masters thing. Um, I've learned a lot from, like I say, from, from so many different composers and so many different musicians. Um, I think if you sort of listen to bees and go, well, it's not by Mozart, so it probably isn't very good. Um, you know, you might say that flippantly sometimes, but actually on a profound level, I don't really believe that. You know, you can learn something from everybody. I learn from my students all the time. I mean, I know that, again, that's a big cliche, people say that, but I do genuinely learn from my students. Um, and often they'll say things you think, you know, you're right, actually, I've, mis I've, mis I've thought of th about that in the wrong way. But really, I, th I think in terms of the great masters, you know, it's useful to learn from them because they did what they did so well. Um, but they were just people doing what they could do as well as possible. And they were obviously exceptionally good at it. But again, they all worked so hard to get to where they got to. I mean, if you think about Mozart, you know, oh, child genius, all this sort of thing. But I mean, the guy was, he was 
doing counterpoint exercises. I mean, as far as we could tell from the age of four or five, you know, regularly, he was spending hours and hours and he was practicing his, practicing his piano. And by the time he was, what, five or six years touring the world, playing the piano, I can't remember what the age was. I'm making this up here. I'm not a Mozart expert. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's important to be very clear about that is that, you know, yes, you have to be talented, um, but there are so many talented people out there. That's not a unique thing. Um, the people who are, who, who are very successful, it's a combination of talent and hard work and situation and a bit of fortune and the right people and you know there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into that um it's not just oh well he was a great master so i mean i love beethoven but all the stuff you read about him oh my word i mean if you read sort of early 20th century commentary on beethoven and you know the great genius that came from above and oh you just you just can't i mean if if, if you're a composer and you aspire to that you need to stop right now and just have a bit of a reality check we live when we live we learn what we learn and the, the more i mean britain it might have been Britain, it might have been somebody else. The famous quote about the harder you work, the luckier you get. Um, is I think fundamentally it. You know, you just you just need to keep at it, keep making. And uh if it's good, um that's great. But uh yes, I mean it's not I suppose the important thing to say is like I say, there are there are very talented people and there are people who, you know, have, have different talents um in, in any in any field. And I think it you know, the successful ones have that need to have that combination. But I think um, to kind of restrict your listening to, oh, well, you know, the great operas are by Puccini, Verdi, and Mozart, so I will listen to those and nothing else. And that's crazy. There's so many great operas out there by by composers you've never heard of and composers who are much more famous in their time as well, you know. So, um, yeah, so, so I just really think, I, I think I, I would always discourage students from anything like the sort of the great master approach to things. You know, you might teach them because they serve a particular purpose. Um, or because they codify. So, I mean, you know, people often complain about Bach style harmony, for example, which anyone who's ever studied classical music in the last, well, maybe not so, more, so much recently, but most people have done some of that kind of four part arranging in the style of Bach. The reason we study that is because it codifies the whole history of harmony making um, so clearly that you can study it as a consistent entity. And yes, Bach was a great, great composer. His music is extraordinary, but that's, it doesn't mean that he was the only composer we should be listening to from that time. Okay, let us go. Um, let's listen to one of your one of your works now. Uh, this is titled Orange. So we'll listen to this and we'll, we'll then we'll come back and resume the interview. Um, I, I think this is quite an interesting, quite an interesting piece. So uh, to our audience, everybody, please join us as we listen to Orange, one of the compositions by our guest composer of today. It's about three minutes long. <laughs>
So that was orange by our guest composer of the day of today. Uh, how many instruments were in that composition? Oh, just the two violins. Um, it's just the two, the two, uh, the two violins. So, so the violinist, uh, the violinist there are uh, Harriet McKenzie, who I mentioned earlier, who's played a lot of my pieces, and uh, Philippa Moog, who is also a friend from when I was at the academy, although I didn't stay in touch with her for a while. And then her and Harriet started working together as Rhetorica a few years ago. They they don't work together anymore at the moment. But um, so this piece, uh, I can't even remember when I wrote this. It's at least 10, 12 years ago, uh, I think. Um, it's now become part of a bigger piece, which I wrote for them with electronics called Dances and Chorales, um, which they premiered, I think, two, three years ago now. So it's just the two violins but they also in that piece obviously they shout quite a lot and yeah. they and they That's stamp they stamp a little bit. They, actually, <laughs> they added the stamp at the end uh, that was their idea um so you know they're the sort of they're the sort of players who when you say to them i'm writing a piece they go oh that's exciting or they ask you for a piece and say well oh you know if, if you want to do some singing or some shouting or some stamping or something yeah. interesting uh you know, go for it they're, they're really imaginative performers and they bring so much creativity to a piece uh, and the way they respond to it. So I spent a lot of time workshopping with them um, a couple of years, a few years ago. And I know them both very well. They're good friends. But they also, you know, they'll play something and they'll, and they'll say, is this right? Is this exactly what you're looking for? Could, could we do it this way? Could we try that? You know, so there's a kind of constant dialogue and the piece grows um, uh, as you work with them. So they're a real joy to work with. I worked with a lovely, excuse me, a French quartet a few years ago. Um, that uh, released a disc last year with this piece of mine on it was the same sort of thing they wrote to me and they said i didn't know them at all and they wrote and they said um could you write a piece that uh that includes um stamping and shouting and clapping and dancing even if you like you know they really wanted something and it's a real joy because you you can then you can go to a rehearsal knowing that if you do any of that they're not going to go Oh, I don't like doing that sort of thing, which, which, you know, with a lot of players, they just want to play their instruments because that's what they're good at and they're very comfortable with. And, and, you know, and often you think, well, these players, they play so well, why would you ask them to do anything else? But, um, you know, these, these, uh, this, this French quartet and, and Harriet and, and Philippa, they're exceptional players. They're wonderful players, but they also want more, you know, they, they're really buzzing with energy and ideas and they and, you know, I, if, it's the thing I think every composer needs is a few comp a few musicians who just want to engage with what you do and help you do it better, um, and and be excited about what you do. And uh, so that that's been a very positive relationship. Hmm, that's interesting. So collaborating with um with your performers is very important, and hopefully meeting the right kinds of performers, the ones with the mindset that share your ideas and your viewpoint. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've I've never really uh, sent any applications to competitions, for example. I think I, I've sent off for one or two masterclasses over the years. Um, and I don't, off the top of my head, I don't actually think I've applied for maybe more than one or two competitions ever. Because it just, it, it for me, music is about people. And, you know, working with people who are interested and engaged is such a wonderfully positive experience in a way that sitting in your room, writing a piece and sending it to competition, for me, is much less stimulating. So I try, I tend to work um, with people that I enjoy working with, people I find interesting. Um, you know, and sometimes you get a commission in from somebody you don't know, and then you try and sort of work out what it is that they do and try and engage with them. Um, as people as much as possible, I think, because I, like I said, I just, for me, that is what I find stimulating and exciting. Um, yeah. Right. You gave an interview a number of years ago, and you said, I'm just going to read the quote here. I'm always interested in locating my work in a South African frame. You also hinted at being a South African earlier and how it uh, influences your work or your interest, I suppose, mm -hmm. with your output. Um, and you said it's because of its obvious importance to me, so to yourself. I mean, has this changed over the years, considering the fact that you have been physically outside yes. of it? But you did, yeah. I guess, you sort of told us that you have been engaged. So being physically distant from South Africa, has this changed over time? Are you still with that focus and that interest and that inclination? I, you know, I think fundamentally, I don't think I'll ever stop being in my own mind if nobody else is. I will never stop being a South African or a South African composer. Um, and it's, I mean, it, it has changed over time, definitely my understanding of what that means and my understanding of my situation and where I am. Um, 
in relation to other South African composers, for example, you know, yes, I don't live the daily reality of South Africa, which is very different in some ways and also not different at all in other ways, which is one of the weird things, I guess, um, to how it is here in, in the UK. You know, there, there are things that are almost identical. I mean, my wife's mother, we were talking about this with my sons this, uh, yesterday, actually, we went for a walk and we were chatting about um, the fact that uh, my wife and I had an enormously similar upbringing in terms of our mothers were spoke they, they said all the same things to us they had we had you know we had the same kenwood mixing bowl uh, you know um for making cakes you know and she that, my wife still has that mixing bowl that i had in cape town at the same time so in terms of kind of global culture there's that really interesting kind of thing where there's a lot that, of, about my life in south africa that actually is not that different here but of course there's a lot that really is very very different and um i you know i completely understand that my situation here is different um I try to engage uh, as I can, and it's much easier now than it used to be. Um, it's much easier now to engage, I think, with uh, what's going on in other parts of the world through things like Facebook. And I think because of the challenges in South Africa, I think the way South African composers and African composers generally, I mean, your site is another great example. You know, um, we've we've used social media very actively south african composers african composers have used social media even more actively in some ways um as this actually their main source of self-promotion and publicity and marketing and that sort of thing and so i've been very fortunate with that in terms of the timing of where i am now that i can even though i'm not there i can keep up with uh at least some of what's going on and i try to know i try to keep up with who the young composers are and how what the big compo bigger composers are doing yeah the older composers use. Um, think about children here. Um, you know, the older composers, what, what sort of work are they doing? What does their music sound like? So whenever there's an opportunity to listen to a piece that's been released, I try to take it, um, or if there's a live broadcast even. Um, just because, uh, and, and really one of the main reasons for that is, is purely selfish, which is that I really feel that the South African context and being South African is one of the sort of sort of quite fundamental to how I think about the world. And even though I've been here for the length of time I have, but it, my life is now roughly half in South Africa and just recently, shall I say, sort of roughly half in the UK. Um, it's, uh, it, it is still a very, it feeds, you know, the music of South Africa and, and of other South African really feeds me um, really in, in a way that is important to me and it might be completely irrelevant to everybody else, but it really does mean something to me. And, you know, what the reasons for that might be other than that, you know, I'm South African, um, and that means something to me. So, the, so the music and the context of South Africa is very important to me, uh, both personally and musically. The other thing, of course, is um, I have the other side of that is when I'm invited, and I've been very lucky to be invited uh, four or five times. I've gone to things like the National Youth Orchestra in South Africa, and I've written them pieces on two occasions, and they've performed them. Um, and that has given me the opportunity, at least in one instance, to work with the young musicians and the young composers. Um, and then also I worked, uh, I've worked a couple of times with uh, the New Music in Taba, which the New Music South Africa used to run. And I've been able to meet young composers and uh, work with them, look at their work, teach them, talk to them about music and that sort of thing in sort of more or less formal context there have been workshop proper workshop context other places where i just had a chance to chat to people some rehearsals i conducted some some new pieces in bloemfontein a few years ago um and also quite often um i get young South African composers contacting me when they're thinking about studying abroad and for advice and um, ideas and just general conversations and they sometimes come and visit me for, for tuition and that sort of thing so i try and keep up in that sort of way um, and obviously facebook's great also just for knowing what other people are doing so you should sort of learn about what um what other young southern musicians are doing and um, trying to keep in touch with them uh so yeah i mean i i, I feel that that feeds me creatively and like i say you know wh whatever it means for anybody else i know that for myself it, it's it's kind of the in a way it feels to me like the sort of bedrock on which whatever i might do uh happens but you know one is constantly learning one is constantly evolving one is constantly changing both, both consciously and unconsciously um because of the situation you're in and you know there's not much you can do about that i'm you know i married a british woman and i live in britain so that that's where i am you know i've got two, two children who i think are although they've been to south africa both of them and they like it but they're definitely british children you know there's no question about that um much as i might uh, think it would be nice if they had a little bit more south african I, yeah so yeah okay uh we have gone over our uh, schedule we have, I'm sorry it's been brilliant we do have quite a number of topics I would still like to explore. So I don't, we'll have to find a way to manage this. Um, 
thank you to all those who are still watching us live and those who are commenting. It's been brilliant. I hope you are, I mean, from the comments, I can see everybody's having a good time and enjoying this interview. Yeah. Thank you to our guests once again. But um, let's see how much of this we can cover. Uh, okay. with, with, you know, I guess using a few more minutes on of our interview <laughs> to extend the interview by a few more minutes. Have you observed any expectations uh, as an African to only talk about certain subjects when you compose music? And does mm. this image frustrate you i know that for you i've noticed by looking at your profiles you have an interest in communicating messages but has anybody mm. ever hinted that you should communicate particular messages like about apartheid suffering yeah. beauty of Africa? you know i i'll be really honest and um nobody has ever said to me oh you should just talk about this or this is the sort of thing that's appropriate and, and i'm very conscious actually that one of the reasons for that um is of course that i'm white and people see me and they don't go, oh, he's African, so we should ask him to be more African. People sort of, I, th I think, I mean, one of the strong senses I had, and I talked a bit about this when I was, uh, well, I thought a lot about this when I was doing my PhD, is, is that because of my color, uh, people engage with me very differently and sort of seeing how people engage with black South Africans and black Africans um, in the sort of way you describe uh, is, is very interesting. Um, and in, in a way, it's, uh, it's kind of, you know, as as is often the case of being white, it has shielded me um, from a lot of that sort of thing. So I think people are sometimes a bit perplexed um, because uh, you know what is white South African culture is 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 in itself a really fascinating question, um, which perhaps we don't need to go into today, but certainly one that's worth uh, thinking about. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. But um, so yes, I think I've. Uh, I've sort of made creative choices because of things that interest and stimulate me, not because people have said to me, you should do more of this, or you should do uh, less of that, um, which is great. And, and I suppose, yeah, yeah, I, I have, like I said, basically just been shielded from that in a way by surely by purely by being white. And people kind of don't always know how to relate to the fact that I'm interested in South African music, I think. So, you know, that that's a big kettle of, <laughs> big kettle, big kettle of worms, that one. It's, it's an interesting one. Um, and yeah. I, don't, I, I don't have any easy answers for it, to be honest. But but I've, it has meant, like I say, that uh, people generally don't have that sort of expectation. Um, I think, interestingly, uh, you know, I've, uh, there's a really interesting talk by uh, Bongani and Dorada Breen um, from his uh, Radcliffe, uh, Red Radcliffe, I think, fellowship that he's doing in Harvard at the moment. Um, he did a very interesting talk about uh, South African music, and he talked a bit about the, you know, the pressures in the 90s um, from various quarters, you know, to, to be more African. Um, and there sort of became this sort of trend of kind of sticking bits of African melody or bits of rhythm or whatever into your into your music and you know i think uh for me a composer needs to be working with material that means something to them and that is personally um and that stimulates them to be more creative and i think you know the sort of imperative of you should be this you should be that is simply not an imperative any composer needs i think you, you as a composer you need to make choices uh as freely as you can within the context that you're in being respectful obviously to you know whatever it is that you're referencing whether it's john cage or you know miles davis or um i don't know Busi Muflongo, you know it doesn't really matter who you refer referencing you have to be respectful to that and and not sort of rewrite that music and say well this is my music i mean that obviously is problematic but i think if you understand influences being things that feed you creatively um, as long as you respond creatively to the music rather than just trying to reproduce it, I think um, then you are composing uh, rather than sort of just re arranging or recreating. I know you hinted that this is a topic, this might be a topic for another day, but I want to dwell on that for a bit, sure. just a short, a short while except that we are going way, way beyond our time. If it is okay with you, do you mind if we explore that subject? It's, it's, it's fine for now. My son's on shouting yet, so it's all okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you say people and expectations, mm. it's interesting. I, I think I thought you were going to talk about people who are not Africans, but from what you've mm. said, it sounds as if the expectations are also coming from Africans as well, expectations on you. Um, I think, I, I, to be honest, I don't really feel anyone has any expectations of me at all. Um, I, and uh, if they do, I apologize if I've uh, um, not realized them or done, done anything wrong. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, composers need to exist in that space where they are doing what they need to do. Um, and so expectations are, you know, what they are. I mean, people can expect things of you, but ultimately you need to 
make choices for yourself, really. Um, but you don't feel like you need to explain yourself because you did, you did mention your demographic. Yes. Um, there, are, there are some of us who, I guess, we are raised in a way where these things don't matter. But do you ever feel that, oh, I have to explain why I have the right to do this? You just um, no, I, I don't actually think so. Um, I think, you know, we're in a world where people do feel and uh, like they can can kind of tell you what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. You know, Twitter and Facebook, as we know, are famous for shaming people and taking people down and telling them what they should and shouldn't do. And actually, I really think um, as a composer, your your responsibility is to yourself because you know, it goes back to what I was saying earlier with Michael Finnessy saying, well, you know, could you stand, could you, could you hover over your grave and watch people putting you into, into the ground and go, that was definitely what I meant to say, you know, and again, he, he never put it in those terms, but that was essentially it, you know, can, can you stand by what you've done? And, um, you know, ultimately people can agree or disagree with that and, you um, I'm sure there are people who disagree with what I do, but but I do what I do because it's important to me, and I will continue to do so. I think. Um, That's right. I mean, it must be it must be quite a strain if to have that kind of expectation. I suppose mm. for anybody who is aware of it and who applies it, allows it to influence their work. Speaking as an African, I've never ever considered that there might be people in the world who will say, "Oh, you shouldn't compose in the style of Bach because you are not a European." Yes. But yeah. there people like that, that <laughs> absolutely i mean that, that that's exactly right i think but, but you see this is also the other thing that uh that as far as i'm concerned social media has really revealed to us which is that and you know I, i've sort of known this from the past because i've um i've been involved with organizations where you do a performance and you would straight away get back feedback from the audience you know you'd give out to audience uh audience All feedback right. forms and you know you do a piece uh i mean there was one particular theater music theater piece that i did a few years ago where um you know, the feedback ranged from this is one of the most exciting things I've ever seen to something that basically said this is one of the worst things I've ever seen. And, you know, in a way, as a composer, you've succeeded then because you've stimulated people to respond um, and they've not just gone, yeah, that was all right. Um, so for me, I, I think, you know, people uh, what that but what that illustrates to me and what I think Facebook and social media generally has really shown us is that people's opinions are incredibly broad um, and there are people who uh, in the world who fundamentally disagree with whatever you say um, and whatever you say there will be somebody who can disagree with it and often large proportions of society disagree with it so you know I think you sort of have to accept that I mean I, th I always think of people like Philip Glass um, and Steve Reich in the 60s you know uh, who when they started doing what they were doing the response was either well that's just rubbish don't do it um, or if they got a big commission, people are like, well, why would you do that? That's not that's not even music. Why? What is this? You know, in the context of you know the European avant-garde and all the fluxes, you know, the, it was all very experimental and suddenly a lot and often very you know you mentioned the word atonal. Often that's very strictly serial or highly atonal, very complex textures and all that sort of thing. And suddenly here comes Philip Glass and he sits and plays arpeggios for a while or you know whatever it might be. Um, massive uh, simplification of the situation there but um <laughs> but, but they but they chose to do that and they said well this is what i'm going to do and i'm going to keep doing it until everyone goes oh that's actually quite good and that's exactly what's happened you know in the in the first sort of 20 years of their of their creative of the of the life of the music of philip glass um as we know it now uh about half of the population in uh, well probably a lot more than that half of the music critics probably you know 70 85% of the music critics are going, well, this is just terrible and nobody should ever listen to this and it should be banned straight away. Um, and then about 15, 20% were going, well, this is quite interesting. This is new. We've not heard this sort of thing before. And now, I mean, you can't see a movie without there being a Philip Glass soundtrack. He has changed the conversation. You know, he is literally, um, and not on his own, there's a whole lot of people, there's a whole nexus of composers and creative artists and societies yeah. changed and all those sort of things that have all changed but as a result of him making that, him and a whole lot of other people making those choices and saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. And just going, well, that's fair enough. You can all hate me for it, but I'm going to keep doing it because it's important to me. And then in doing so, it then, it, it, you know, if you stick to it and it is interesting and it does capture the moment and it is what the world needs at that moment for whatever reason, then you can be very successful. You could also be a complete failure and nobody can ever listen to your music. And that's it's just a gamble we take. You know, um, if, you, if you commit to something, mm -hmm. um, some people will buy it and some people won't. And, you know, if, you, if you're willing to accept that. I mean, the other thing Finnessy said to me, he said, well, you must be yourself. And then he said, 
Don't expect anybody to thank you for it, though. Um, and and that's, that is fundamentally the choice you make as a composer. You either go, well, I can just kind of write stuff that I know people are going to like, and it'll sort of fit this particular audience. The classical music audience will like that, so I'll keep writing that. It's nice, it's pretty, and I'll go, oh, that's lovely, very moving, whatever it is. And that's great, and I don't judge composers to do that, and often they write fabulous music, so it's really not an issue at all. But my approach is more to say, well, I'm trying as much as possible, and I'm getting it wrong loads of the time, I'm just trying to say what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to get across the points in, the, in, in a very kind of musical, kind of cultural way rather than a specific uh, uh, verbal points. I'm just trying to say what I'm trying to say. And, and if people want to hear it and agree with that, that's great. If they don't want to hear it and they don't agree with that, well, obviously it makes me sad and a bit poorer. But, you know, I've, I've got to keep trying to be more, to do what I do more. And that's just the nature of it. Oh, interesting. Thank you very much for that. It, it is yeah. a bit of a challenge, especially with the um, the use of social media nowadays to challenge voices, even though the voices that are speaking know what they are talking about. Mm -hmm. Those with minimal knowledge of the topic can decide to say you should not be talking about these subjects. It's a bit of a challenge, but so well done for, you know, things that has been pushing through and for encouraging others to mm -hmm. maintain, you know, their stance as long as they know that it's the story they want to tell. Absolutely. And it applies to them on the field. Yeah. You know, um, uh, speaking of uh, composers who have influenced music globally or locally, do you do you think that the African composer is aware of his or her responsibility to export what Africa has? We appear to be very good at imitating, borrowing, copying, um, so many other words to use to describe. And I'm, this is not trying to be insulting. This is to an extent mm. is reality for us. Um, of course, there are those who will say a lot of it was imposed by the way, so it's not well, well, it absolutely, absolutely was, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, what what is your opinion or um, the work that is being done by African composers when it comes to well teaching, exporting? Yeah. I I think uh, I think there are a number of uh, there are a lot of African composers who actually do quite remarkable things. I mean, I think of someone like Akin Yuba, who really was a bit of a, for a long time, but uh, he must have felt like a bit of a lone voice in the wilderness. Uh, but he just he just went, I'm doing this. Um, and I'm going to study this and I'm going to talk about this. And he he just he built up a really remarkable repertoire. I mean, I don't know a lot of his music, but everything I hear is it's it's fascinating. I mean, uh, with my vocal on well, with a couple of my singers and a pianist in my vocal ensemble, we did his six Yoruba songs, uh, which we've got up on our on our on our uh, SoundCloud. Um, the Yoruba's uh, not very good um, because uh, I, we got a little bit of coaching from somebody who has, has some second-hand knowledge. But, but we, did, we, did our, we did our best, basically. But um, you know, they're, they're really fascinating songs because they they take uh, what is kind of essentially, on a certain level, a kind of Victorian parlour song mm -hmm. uh, language on, on in terms of the piano accompaniment and sort of superimposes on that in a really interesting way, a kind of in traditional folk songs and texts, and and they're really beautiful and they're absolutely unique. Um, you know, I don't know any other music like it, and for me, that is really special. Um, and it's, re and I think there are a lot of composers who are doing that. Um, I think that one of the big challenges we have, of course, is that uh, you know, just on a very simple level, um, the composition and the music market now is so flooded with so many voices. You know, the, the the reality of being a musician today is that you're competing with literally millions and millions and millions of other people, no matter what you do. You know, whether you're a singer songwriter or you're a band or you're a I don't know, jazz ensemble, whatever it is, you're competing for people's time in an incredibly saturated market. So that, I think, is one of the fundamental difficulties, is that people have uh, very little knowledge of African new music, and that's sort of gradually changing. And, of course, the work that you do, the work uh, that New Music South Africa does and certainly did very well for a while, um, the work that Samro does uh, trying to promote South African composers, and also just the work that individuals do to kind of take things out and, excuse me, take pieces out and perform them in the world. You know, there are quite a few projects. Uh, Birmingham uh, Conservatoire, for example, there are a couple of performers there, Naomi Sullivan and uh, a young clarinetist, South African clarinetist, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head. But they did a really interesting project with South African composers, um, you know, because of the New Music South Africa connection with the ISCM, uh, the International Society for, for New, uh, Contemporary Music. Um, we've had a number of South African composers performed in those big days. I mean, and that, you know, it's not necessarily massive stuff that's happening, but slowly but surely, there are there are things being performed around the place, and um, it's. I, I think 
I mean, again, I don't think anyone has any responsibility to anything. You know, there's this idea of, oh, well, you know, you have a responsibility as this type of person to do this type of thing. And I think, you know, if, if it feeds you and it is interesting to you, you'll do it and you'll do it as well as you can. So I think if it is interesting um, to you or to me, I mean, just personally, to go around sort of supporting and promoting South African or African composers more broadly, we'll do it. And, we, and you know, I've done it in, in certain instances and you're doing it very actively. And that's because it's in some way helpful to us. But I think um, there's not there's not much more that can be done, particularly because, and of course, you know, it always comes back to resources, doesn't it? That, um, you know, where, you know, if I wanted to get the London Symphony Orchestra to play a program of South African orchestral music, the amount of money involved is pretty substantial. You know, it's a it's a good good few thousand pounds at least to, just just to get a rehearsal or two, let alone a performance and a concert date and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't, and we're we're all coming from a position where our currencies are significantly at a at a disadvantage. So mm -hmm. even if we can raise vast sums of money in South Africa or Nigeria, we bring it over here, and suddenly it looks like peanuts. Um, so it's it's tricky but i think really just we all just have to keep talking about it and promoting it if it if it is helpful to us to do so and then it means something to us to do so i think there's nothing worse than feeling it's a responsibility to do so yes yes um i perhaps responsibility is seen as a strong word but what i am quite concerned about is how africa seems to always be a recipient even though whether we recognize oh, yes. we have a lot to contribute yes so yes. I'm, I'm not sure that we are aware that we have a lot to contribute and in fact we are we are at a fresh point so we've we've inherited imported but we've not exported yes. enough so i'm, I'm yes. looking at, you know yeah. at, at it from that point of view are we even aware of this? i i think that is an absolutely brilliant point and i think it's something that uh we have all suffered from as africans for a very long time uh the, the idea that somehow we, we we are net importers of everything um and actually yes i think we do you know i, I think uh going back to the sort of idea in the you know when when composers were suddenly encouraged to incorporate african elements um if you study that you sort of realize that actually you know in south africa at that moment in time in the 1980s there was already an entirely uh, indigenous for want of a better word south african choral culture that was absolutely unique um that had been developed by choristers and composers and conductors in order to mostly for the competitions and that sort of thing but also just because they were really interested in it and, and they'd made an entire style of music on their own um that was unique to south africa and i think now we see that a lot of that kind of choralism around africa but um something like that or something like you know uh you know the um with Lady Smith Black and Mombasa, obviously, as a great example of that, you know, the there are these extraordinary things that are unique to, you know, all African countries have them, um, and where people have seen profit in that, they have been exported. So obviously, uh, you know, there are some great pop artists, and you know, of various uh, types of pop, I use in a very loosely broad term, uh, broad sense, uh, who've been very successful. Um, but in terms of contemporary classical music, I think you're right. I think there is a lot of interesting stuff going on. Um, and the challenge, yes, the, cha the challenge is how how to get it out there and and just doing what you can to do so, I think is really important. I've always felt that, you know, I, I mean, it, it's it's been kind of a, a basic tenet of belief for me that Africans at this moment in history have uh, some of the richest range of potentials to draw on, um, both from Africa, but also internationally, in terms of working out who you want to be and what you want to be. Uh, and because we're not sort of held down by the historical stuff that a lot of, uh, you know, in, in the UK, you often, you often see, you know, that kind of classic thing is somebody asks you to write a string quartet, and everybody goes, Oh, but how do I write a string quartet after Bartok and Shostakovich and Beethoven? And I go, well, I don't care. It's a string quartet. It's four instruments, you know, um, yes, those are great composers, but I, I don't need to be uh, down by that um i can do something that i want to do with it and i think i think that's enormously valuable and i think it's it it's been going on in africa ever since uh africa was um was colonized for the first time you know people in africa have gone okay well that's interesting i'll use that and 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 in doing so have kind of developed enormously rich culture that uh, across the continent all these different cultures and uh, ways of being in a sort of world that's somewhere between being modern and you know, pe people are constantly negotiating that relationship, yeah. aren't they, uh, between uh, what was and what is and what could be and all that sort of thing. And I think that gives, uh, I really believe that, that it gives, um, very broadly speaking, African people who have the opportunity um, to speak 
uh, to use a very kind of uh, broad word, um, it gives them something to say. It really does, you know, I think which which is unusual and is uh, interesting and is also very often very powerful. Um, so yes, I completely agree with you, basically, in a very long way of saying it, is I think we do need to export it more and we need to find ways to do so. Okay. Uh, we have two more questions. I've had to narrow the conversation down. To only really two sorry, more. talk too much. <laughs> no, this is this has been brilliant. You you're widely performed um, in different parts of the world, in the UK and South Africa. Specifically, I picked these two. But out of all the performances of your works, which one so far has been a dream come true for you? Um, that's really hard. Um, I think, you know, going back to what I was saying before, the things I've always enjoyed most is working, the thing I've always enjoyed most is working with people who mean something to me um, and who are completely engaged because, you know, we're friends and we, we find each other interesting and stimulating. So I think probably one of the big things for me, you know, and I, I'm, I'm going to upset lots of people here, um, uh, I would say one, can I have three? Is three okay? Um, so I think... <laughs> performance that really stands out for me was the premiere of my violin concerto at the Purcell Room with my friend Harriet McKenzie um, playing the violin. Uh, she asked me to write a piece for her. I wrote it and she performed it there and it was in 2006 and that piece, she's recorded it. It's on a, on a wonderful disc of um, uh, violin concertos with the English Symphony Orchestra. Um, but that that performance was, was a great moment for me. Um, but to be honest, any performance with Harriet is always exciting for me because we have such a good working relationship and she's such a good friend. Um, similarly, um, I think the, uh, there have been a few performances by um, the Zygmunt Quartet, for example, uh, that my friend Sandy van Dijk is in. Um, he, uh, I did an arrangement, actually. Uh, I, basically, I wanted to put in a concert in about 2005 in London of music by South African composers. And for that, I didn't have anything that was really appropriate. So I arranged the piece for cello and piano for viola and string and the rest of a string quartet because he was over with his string quartet at the time the Santongo quartet so that was a very um, moving performance and also he's performed a, a a string quartet that i wrote a few years later he performed with his zygmunt quartet um in cardiff and that was a very special performance and i think uh, the other uh, performances i would highlight i think are really by um so I've been very fortunate to work with Dara Morgan and um, the Fidelia Trio and Mary DeLay. Um, so Dara and Mary are married. They're, uh, they're Irish, but they've been living in the UK for a long time. And they are absolutely amazing contemporary music performers. I mean, they're fabulous musicians all round, but they've been, they've been particularly committed to contemporary music. So I've been very fortunate to work with them. And I think um, they've, they've played a number of my pieces. They've recorded my, my CD, Tracing Lines, um, with uh, Carla Reese, who's also been very important. She's a flautist, plays uh, mostly quarter tone flutes, alto flute and bass flute, and she's been a wonderful supporter as well. Um, so basically, I'm just going to ramble on saying all the wonderful people that I've, that I've worked with. And uh, so I'm going to stop there and just say that, you know, all, working with all of those performers, I've had wonderful, wonderful uh, experiences. And there are many others. Um, I'd, I'd better stop. But there, there are so many other wonderful performers. And, and it's, it's always just exciting when somebody plays something and has put time into it, has tried to engage with it and performs it really well. And I've had many of those. And I've been very, very fortunate with that. Okay, and the last question is talking about today and where you are. Are you in lockdown and um, what were you doing before lockdown and has that been impacted? You did talk about a premiere that was supposed to happen or a performance around uh, the opera. Yes. With you now, how are you doing? How are you managing? What, what's happening? Um, well, I, th I think like, probably like many composers, we spend so much time at home anyway. Um, it's that that sort of part of life hasn't changed at all. You know, I still I still sort of sit at my desk and compose most mornings. So um, my wife is a professional viola player. And so, of course, she's uh, in this terrible position where all of her work and she had a lot of work lined up over the next few months in the last few months. And um, that's all being cancelled. So she has uh, been uh, homeschooling our children um which has been uh, actually, and she's also been doing some teaching as well online um but whilst so she's taken that responsibility so i've been very very lucky um uh, she's uh, been a very good primary school teacher she's turned out to be i mean she's very good at everything so that's not that surprising but she's um she's been looking after them so i've been able to keep working as i normally would so I've, all of my teaching has gone online like again like everybody else i've done lots of composition seminars with tutors uh, i mean with with one-to-one -one tutorials but also group tutorials um unfortunately all the performing stuff so we were meant to have a uh, with my contemporary music group at the, at the university i was meant to have 
um, a we were meant to be world doing two world premieres by Peter Maxwell Davies um, of some very early pieces of his in a Maxwell Davies study day a couple of weekends ago. Um, but unfortunately that was cancelled. Uh, and there are a few things, there's there's a possibility, um, so I'm busy writing a violin and cello duo for an absolutely fabulous pair of musicians who live nearby who are uh, David Adams and Alice Neary and they're principal players in the local orchestras here, but also just extraordinary, beautiful, wonderful musicians and they run a little festival. And that's meant to happen at the end of June, so we're still not quite sure whether it's happening yet. And um, so that that's an interesting question mark at the moment and then like you said the opera at the moment we haven't made a decision yet but uh, you know as time goes on it looks more and more unlikely that we'll be able to actually do the premiere this year but we're still planning to do it maybe early next year but that will all just depend but life kind of basically has gone on quite um i basically just kept working so i'm um, it's it's no quieter it's no different except that i'm just always in my office where i am now rather than going into the university to teach and coming home mm. and everybody's keeping safe and staying healthy uh, yes, we've all been fine. We've been very lucky. Um, also, I've got two two sons who are um, who are great and kind of keep the energy levels going, uh, and sometimes cause some frustration as children do. But they they've been really brilliant, and you know, ha having the time to spend with them, you know, doing a bit of work and then going down and having lunch with them and chatting to them is always just great fun and and stimulating in all sorts of great ways. So no, we've we've been very lucky. Okay. It's been really interesting to talk to you today. Thank you very much for being our guest composer for today. It's an absolute thank pleasure. You. Well, for the brilliant thank, conversation. <laughs> well, th thank you very much for for asking such great questions, but also for, again, you know, for such a great job that you're doing. I mean, every day things appear, and I think, oh, I don't know that composer. Oh, I don't know that composer. Oh, this isn't that. And uh, you know, so I'm, I'm I'm trying to catch up at the moment with, uh, with quite a few of the interviews. Um, I've listened to your lovely interview with Hendrik, which is fascinating, and and I've started listening to Claire's and the one you did with Conrad. And I'm hoping to explore some of the other composers on there as well, many of whom I don't know. So um, it's it's really, really vital that you're doing this. And we and I think we all say an enormous thank you to you for it. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks. That's really um, good to hear and humbly as well. Thank you for following up on the interviews as well, the past interviews. Uh, thanks to everyone who is watching us live. I can see 12 people are watching us live. Thanks to everybody who has been engaging in the comment section. Yes, thank and to you very much. Who will, watch this, who will watch this interview later as a recorded interview. Um, it's been very interesting. Thank you. And um, I hope everybody continues to stay as safe as possible and enjoy as much as possible the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.